Have you eaten yet? At one time, this was the most common form of greeting amongst Chinese in Canada. Hello, I'm Sid Tan, and welcome to A Common Bond, the Gold Mountain Edition. Have you eaten yet? We'll get back to that later, but right now, I'd just like to say that I'm as pleased as plum sauce on a barbecue duck to have with us three members of Army, Navy, Air Force Veterans Unit 280. We're going to shoot the breeze, and chew the fat about little-known incidences and well-known issues in the Chinese-Canadian community. These will probably be of concern to most Canadians. Without further ado, I'd like to get this chop suey of a show going by introducing our three guests. To my far right is Harry Kahn, a member of the Order of Canada. He's the co-author of From China to Canada, the definitive book of Chinese communities in Canada. He's also been past president of the Chinese Freemasons in Canada and presently president of the Vancouver chapter of the Chinese Freemasons. He's the director of the Chinese Times and he served with Force 136 in the Burma India Theater of Operations with Lord Louis Mountbatten. Welcome to our show, Mr. Khan. Thanks, Sid. Just call me Harry. I'll call you Harry. Thank you, Harry. Okay. Next to Harry is Roy Ma. Roy Ma is the editor of the Chinatown News and a past president and secretary of the Army, Navy, and Air Force Veterans Unit 280. He, along with Harry Kahn, was one of a trio of non-commissioned officers which led the first contingent of Chinese-Canadian servicemen overseas to the India-Burma Theater of Operations under the command of Lord Louis Mountbatten. Welcome to our show, Mr. Mr. Ma. Thank you, Sid. Just call me Roy. I'll call you Roy. Thank you, Roy. And next to Roy, and to my immediate right, is Gim Wang. Gim Wang is presently Secretary of Unit 280, Army, Navy, and Air Force Veterans. He was with the RCAF, the Royal Canadian Air Force, from 1944 to 45. He's a trained air gunner, flight engineer, and had the rank of pilot officer. His father arrived in Canada in 1906 at the age of 15. Mr. Wang is currently 68, having been born in 1922. He's worked as an auto mechanic and a collision repairman for over 40 years. He still likes to customize cars and motorcycles and toodles around on his motorcycle at this time and at this day. Welcome to the show, Mr. Wang. Yeah, thanks, Sid. Yeah, you can call me Gim. Oh, I knew. Thank you, Gim. I guess, first of all, Army, Navy, Air Force Veterans Unit 280. This seems to be a very special unit and it has its own interesting history. We were talking earlier, and uh, Mr. Ma was, was giving us some interesting reasons why it's the Army, Navy, Air Force veterans as opposed to the Royal Canadian Le Legion. I'm just wondering if you could tell our audience a little about that. Well, Sid, uh, let's just say that uh, the Canadian Legion was very happy to accept us as individual members into their uh, different uh, units, whereas the Army and Navy Air Force had no hesitation in issuing a charter to us as a group, all Chinese Canadian unit. And uh, they welcomed such a unit with open arms. So that was the reason why we uh, eventually end up uh, as an affiliate of the Army Navy Air Force veterans in Canada. So, so I guess after the uh after the return of all the servicemen from overseas, did a group of Chinese-Canadian servicemen get together and say, let's form a chapter, approach the Legion, were not able to get a charter, and then decided to form their own group with the Army, Navy, Air Force veterans? Well, a group of us got together and then we explored the uh, various, various uh, options. We uh, did uh, approach the uh, Canadian Legion, make making soundings, uh, you know, to get their reaction, and uh, that was the reaction that we got from them. The, the Army, Navy, and Air Force Veterans Unit is a very well-known 
sort of organization within the Chinese community, and you've done a lot of work. I know that you've been instrumental in putting up plaques at the Chinese Cultural Center, and you've also been supportive of a lot of what we would call Lo Wa Kyo, or Ch early Chinese Canadian history. Uh, Mr. Khan, I wonder if you might tell us how it is that that plaque came to being, and when it came into being, and why it took so long. Yes, uh, you know, uh since the Second World War, uh, uh, our member is about uh, at the, uh, no, during the war, the uh, Chinese uh, Canadian that joined the service totally is about uh, 600 of us. Now, after 40 years, our members, uh, no, the members getting old and uh, they are passing on, so getting less and less. So uh, we feel now is the time to record all those uh, veterans who served in the uh, Second World War, and we should put a plaque on to honor them, to uh, telling the people, the new immigrant and the new citizen that come into this country, that it is you know, this, uh, this group of people, this group of young men who served in the Second World War in order to fight for our right of today. No, the right we got today is not easy to come by. It take a group of us people that during the time uh, before th before the Second World War, we don't have the right as the one uh, as we are having now, and we have to fight for it. Th that's the one of the reason we want to put the plaque up, you know, to uh, honor this group of people who serve the uh, to, to serve the country that we call Canada, and also to serve, with that we serve the Chinese people also in Canada, and also to benefit you know, the new immigrant that comes in to enjoy the privilege they got today. That's one of the reasons we set up the plaque. Well, as I understand, the Army, Navy, Air Force veterans is considered one of the, the major building organizations in terms of the Chinese in Canada. In other words, if it was not for returning war veterans, I think that some of the rights and privileges would have not been that easily attained. But before we get into that, I'd like to uh, understand that at that time, you were all very, very young men. And uh, I guess maybe I'll address Mr. Wong, that uh, how is it that at that time, you came to join the armed forces, especially when you had none of the rights and privileges. What made you decide to join the armed forces? Well, um, <clears throat> I, was, um, I was always interested in um, airplanes and I used to read about um, the First World War flyers and all that sort of thing. And um, I built model planes as a, when I was a kid. And um, when the war started, uh, in 1939, I was uh, 17, and um, I, I, re I read about uh, the Battle of Britain, and uh, I, uh, I just thought it'd be just great to uh, fly a um, Spitfire. Why not? So um, I beat my head against a brick wall for um, three, four years, and uh, they accepted uh, an interview, and uh, I uh, finally talked my way into it. But uh, it wasn't easy. Yeah. Did, did you find any inconsistencies in terms of the fact that here you are fighting for a country which did not allow you rights and privileges of a citizen? Well, you got to remember, if we were born in China, uh, we would be uh, fighting with uh, the Chinese uh, forces there because, uh, you know, we were, we were uh, draft age. And... Um, we consider ourselves 100% uh, Canadian, although uh, we were um, Chinese descent. And, uh, I didn't see that uh, we were fighting the Japanese, uh, the Germans, or the Italians as being any different. And, uh, you know, if we were fighting it from, from China, uh, I thought it was just appropriate because I was born here. And uh, uh, many Chinese did try to get in, yes. But uh, I was one of the lucky ones who got accepted uh, as air crew. Yeah. I I'm a little lost on well, this. Just, oh, yes, uh, let me elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, uh, 
to go back uh, in history, uh, we have to understand the political and social climate of the time. At that time, uh, Chinese Canadians were second-class citizens. Politically, we were completely disenfranchised. We don't have the right to vote. We don't have the right to hold public office. We don't have a right to say in our national or provincial or civic affairs. That's politically. Economically, we were deprived of all kinds of job opportunities. We can't practice law. We can't practice pharmacy. We can't practice uh, accountancy. So in essence, we were nothing more than second-class citizen. When the war came along, we said how to rectify the situation. Now, there were two groups with uh, opposing viewpoints. One group, uh, including myself, said, uh, OK, now that the country is in need of manpower, let's rally to Canada's colors. And when we come back, we would have solid credentials to demand our rights as equal citizens along with the other uh, Canadians. The other group say, no, don't go. Don't enlist now. Wait till they give us, enfranchise us first, recognize us as Canadians first before we will enlist. So there was a debate. And ultimately, our group went out, the group that favors enlisting now and asked for uh, remedying of the situation later that group went out. So that's how we uh, went into the uh, armed forces. Yeah. An interesting thing is that, as I understand, all three of you were born in Canada. And one of the things that we really, I find myself hard to understand is that how you could be living in a country. And I don't understand this not having the franchise and not having the rights and privileges. And I, I'd, I'd just like to ask Mr. Khan if, yeah. if you thought that at that time that particularly going out, joining the armed forces, would lead to more rights and privileges? Or Yes, I, I agree with Roy, because uh, we were there at the same time. I, I remember during that time, uh, we have two choices, as Roy said. One is to go, one is not to go. Uh, the other choice, uh, you could stay behind and join the zombie. You know, you don't have to go overseas. But, uh, my own feeling, my, my own opinion at that time, you know, as long as, as, you, as Roy said, we are young men, we got, you know, a lot of heroism, you know, try to do something for the country, yeah? and also try to do something for the future, you know, future generation of our people. And at that time, uh, my, my way of thinking, uh, you know, we, if we join the service, not only help Canada, indirectly also help our, you know, uh, help, the, help our mother country, you know, China, where we come from. So uh, because uh, the war in Japan and, uh, and the and Kennedy government need us to serve, that's the reason why we, we feel if we serve Canada now, then we will have a better future when we come back. You know? Fortunately, we all come back and we demand our rights. That's why today you know, all our young people like you could enjoy as a Can full Canadian citizenship. Yeah. You could, you could be a sit here, be a producer, a director, or a TV movie star. Huh. You know, the thing we, uh, we could enjoy. Then we have to, no, we, we actually, uh, at that time, most, most of uh, our people who serve uh, have the same feeling that we are fighting for the future, the betterment for our people, and also for Canada. Okay, actually, one of the things that I want to get to, which seems to be uh, uh, an issue that's in Chinatown or in the Chinese-Canadian community now, is redress. And Head Tax Chinese Exclusion Act redress is a part of the community, and we're discussing it. And I, first of all, I'd like to run a short video of Daniel Lee, who's the president, president of the Army-Navy Air Force veterans, stating their position. Uh, his statement was uh, at was videoed at the Chinese Cultural Center on April the 7th. <laughs> 